Now, some Canadians believe that the events in the U.S. are precisely that. They're a uniquely American problem. But my next guest disagrees. Desmond Cole's memoir of being black in Toronto was a cover story in Toronto Life magazine last year. In it, he wrote he was being interrogated by the police and had to do, deal with this more than 50 times solely because he is a black man. Now, join, he's joining me now in our studio. He's a freelance journalist and an activist. Desmond Cole, thank you for coming in this morning. You mentioned to me before we came out that you're exhausted. I, I can completely understand that because it has been a challenging week. But I have to ask you, you know, over the course of the past few years, we've talked about Freddie Gray, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, and then these two black men just this week. And so we have this long list of American black men who've been killed at the hands of law enforcement officers. We don't have a similar list like that in Canada. That's not true, actually. Okay, tell me. Well, uh, this week was the year anniversary of Andrew Loku, okay. a black man who was shot and killed in his apartment building by Toronto police. Okay. In the same month, a black 21-year-old man named Kwasi Skeen Peters was shot and killed by the police. Michael Elegon is a black man who was shot by the police. Junior Manon. I can go on and on and on. There are names in Canada that we don't call out. That we why don't, don't we call them out? Explain I, this to me. Well, why, why don't we know these names? I would hazard to say that it's because our media is more interested in talking about the stories in the United States and sees them as more dramatic and more somehow indicative of a problem there. Mm -hmm. And we spend all that time doing that. And then when it comes to the issues here in our own communities, we're too busy condemning the United States to talk about our own issues and our own problems with racism in our society in general, not just in the police. Okay. There's also another issue about gun culture. And many would argue that the kind of problems you see in the United States, you don't see in Canada because we don't have a culture of guns. So I actually want to play a clip for you and I'd like your response on this. This is Tony Harder. He's the deputy chief of police for, at, for Edmonton. It's a short clip, but he addresses what's taking place in Dallas and why it's not really an issue here. Let's have a look. I think uh, overall, uh, we're in a completely, completely different environment than the one that Dallas, of, Dallas police are working in. And uh, we should be very glad for that. So that's a deputy chief of police in a major Canadian city saying it's unfortunate what happened in Dallas. Speaking specifically to the gun violence issue, where do you stand on that? Oh, of course it's unfortunate what happened in Dallas. It's, it's a crime. And the targeting of police officers is never something that's going to be acceptable. Um, I think what's interesting, though, is that given how fewer people in Canada carry handguns and how the proliferation of guns here is so much less, it is still interesting to me how our police continue to be armed and militarized and getting more weapons in Canada. Sound cannons, more tasers. Now we, want, uh, we have um, these new rifles that Toronto police have. So how come, if we don't have this problem in Canada, our police continue to arm and arm and arm themselves? What is it that they are preparing for? And don't these uh, weapons in the hands of police create a more dangerous society? I absolutely think so. Okay, so lay it out for us. Let's say your perspective is true. What for you are the critical issues between police departments in Canada and people of color? Where, where is there a divide? Where is the tension? I think it's very obvious. The police continue to target racialized people in Canada, continue to stop and document them more, continue to put them in jail more often. Canada's black federal prison population has increased 70% in the last decade. 70%. Where is the conversation about that? We're so busy talking about what happens down there. Mm -hmm. And so what I find interesting, though, is that when we talk about this as black people, as other racialized people in this country, we're told to shut up. Okay. Just this past Sunday, Black Lives Matter Toronto interrupted the Pride Parade. Mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter Toronto is made up of queer and trans people in the organizing group anyway, okay? So what they're saying is, guess what? Police brutality against queer and trans people and against black people is not over. And the whole world, uh, at least most people in this country, told them that was not the right time. But in all the time that we have, in every day that we have our 24-hour news cycle, 
we don't talk about these issues. Right. So when somebody stops a parade and stops our good time and our good feelings, we turn on them and we get angry. But we don't listen to people when they say the discrimination is not over. And that's our problem in this country. Do you think if the Pride Parade had been this weekend and Black Lives Matter Toronto had stopped the parade this weekend after what we've seen in the United States, they would have received a different reaction? No, they would have really? received the reaction that that's the United States and this is Canada and you don't know what you're talking about. How is it that people who do not experience oppression in this way, who do not experience targeting from police, why do they get to have an equal opinion to those who do? If the discrimination is still going on, we're not going to address it because we're going to be too busy telling people who experience it, you do not know what you're talking about. And I think a half hour to stop that, protest, uh, to stop that march and to raise these issues was well worth it. But all of, all of the feelings and all of the privilege that people have makes them not even want to stop for a couple of minutes and listen to people who are saying, I'm sorry, this is still going on. Okay. So tell me what you think are some practical steps, because we're having all these memorials and we're having demonstrations and it's not a practical change. So what do you recommend needs to happen between police departments and people of color in order for this ethnically targeted um, activity from the police to stop? The police have too much power. There isn't some new relationship building that has to happen between police and communities of color. The police use their power disproportionately against us. So we need to take away some of their power. What does that mean? How the do you officers that? who ran up into Andrew Loku's building while he had a hammer in his hand and within seconds of approaching him last year shot and killed this 45-year-old black father of five should never have had weapons in their hands when they came up those stairs because if they didn't, Mr. Loku would still be alive. Now, we're terrified of having that question. We would actually rather see black men like him continue to die than we would to disarm our police. But as long as police have disproportionate power the way they do over the civilian population, folks like us, whose lives don't get grieved in the media, whose stories don't get told in the media, we're going to be on the wrong end of that. And so it's not about some huggy, let's build a relationship, let's be friends now. It's about a power imbalance that for the sake of black and brown and indigenous people in this country must be corrected. Okay, we'll keep the conversation going. Thank you so much for coming in, Desmond. Thanks, Natasha. Desmond Cole is a freelance journalist and activist based here in Toronto.